All right, so tonight we will be talking about Thomas Cranmer, someone I didn't know until now. If you study history, kings, queens, their authorities, and their bishops or archbishops, Cranmer actually comes into play pretty heavily with somewhat of a famous king who had six wives. Does anybody remember that king's name? Tom does. Tom, who was it? Henry VIII. Henry VIII had six wives. Thomas Cranmer plays a role in uh, uh, the annulment process for two of those wives. And then later, uh, bad things happen. So, um, King Henry VI is in uh, leadership in Europe. Europe is about to split completely from the authority of Rome, where the Pope is and now Europe will start to set up its own church its own way. King Henry, King Edward and some others, Charles V who was the king uh, over a lot of the area in Rome and Spain and some other areas start to put themselves over as the authority of the church. So you got the king and then your pope and your church, but the king would have the authority over the church. So whatever he said, uh, if bishops wanted to live they kind of figured out a way to make it stick. So sometimes that happens. And we're going to see about Thomas Cranmer uh, throughout his life. There's a lot of different times where we're going to look at him and go, I, why would he do that? I can't believe that. Uh, that doesn't seem right. Uh, he kind of waffled on that. He kind of gave up in this area. But I think when you see persecution that he deals with and the things that he faces, uh, you don't know what you would do. Uh, we would hope that we would do the right thing. In the end, we see that he does. Uh, he was an English reformer, not always that way. He came into contact with a lot of different English reformers, a couple of different arguments with John Knox and a couple of others who would debate him on certain areas. And at certain times, when he traveled with Charles V, he would travel throughout his kingdom and he would meet all these different people. And he came into close contact with a lot of the different reformers that we've already talked about and some that we're going to talk about. And as he did, it changed the way he thought and the way he did things. Okay. And he was the Archbishop of Canterbury. So Thomas Cranmer, that unworthy hand. Remember that expression. It's going to come back uh, and be one of the last things he says. And as we build through his life, through his story, that quote will hopefully be a motivation for you as you learn to take a stand for your faith, up or down, no matter who the crowd is, no matter what position or place you get put in. So let's get started. His family and studies. Uh, like I said, King Henry VII is the one in charge at the moment. Um, Cranmer was born in 1489, a Slockton in Nottinghamshire, England. It does make you think of Robin Hood, right? But no, eh, not at all. Just because of the Shire part, that makes you think of hobbits or certain members of the Tatum family because they're very small. She's not listening. She's taking, notes. She's taking good notes and I'm picking on her. Thumbs up. She's okay. Uh, his parents, Thomas and Agnes, Nee Hatfield, Cranmer, were of modest wealth and were not members of the aristocracy. Aristocracy are the most popular, famous, wealthy people. They got things done. Uh, it, well, use movies, but uh, they just weren't the most wealthy, but they were the average. Um, he had an older brother, and he inherited the estate. Him and his younger brother kind of were pushed into civil work or ministry, if you want to call it that because they weren't going to inherit anything. At the age of 14, two years after the death of his father, he was sent to the newly created Jesus College in Cambridge. I looked it up online, and that school is still open and accepting students. It was started in 1492, 96, somewhere in there, but they have a website. Uh, it's a Christian college, uh, not necessarily Baptistic, if we want to call it that. But it's still in, in, uh, in uh, usefulness today as it is teaching in Cambridge. So uh, newly created when he was 14 and he went there. It took him eight years to get his undergraduate. <laughs> uh, and then he got his master's in three. So the easy took a really long time. And in the harder master's, he did it much faster. And then shortly after receiving his Master of Arts degree in 1515, he was elected to a fellowship of Jesus College, which basically was like a teacher. Okay? He began studying theology, and by 1520, he had been ordained. The university, already having named him as one of their preachers, he received his Doctor of Divinity degree in 1526. 
So he knows the Bible. In service to Henry VIII. Tom, do you want to sing it again? No? Can it? <laughs> okay, so two recently discovered letters written by Cranmer described an early encounter with the king, Henry VIII of England. Upon Cranmer's return from Spain, so at this time he's traveling with Charles V. Charles V is the ruler over a lot of other areas. He's inherited a lot of it through family. And uh, Europe is starting to branch off and starting to go to war to get rid of it. They don't want to be a part of anything. Uh, they're going to be on their own. So some of the things that you're going to see take place as, as uh, Cranmer, as the archbishop and others, start to separate themselves as Protestant, uh, Spain and Rome is kind of like, let's not fight. Let's, uh, let's just let them uh, take care of their own thing. We don't need another battle, especially with them. Let's just keep them happy. Um, so Cranmer's return from Spain in June 1527, the king personally interviewed Cram. Cram Cramner, for half an hour. Cramner described the king as the kindest of princes. Not princess, but princes. Um, and in that conversation, possibly, was his willingness to help him annul his marriage. Um, Cranmer felt that it was wrong because in the way in which his brother died and his wife was espoused to him to marry, he shouldn't have had to do that. And it was actually against Leviticus 18 or 20 that they can't marry uh, another person's, another brother's uh, wife at that time. And he used that to say, this is why it shouldn't be. So he felt he was right, and it also helped him uh, in, his, in his progress. So he found kind of a common ally in what he, the king wanted, and then kind of Cranmer could be advanced at the same time. From 1527, in addition to his duties as a Cambridge Don, Cranmer assisted with the annulment proceedings of Henry VIII. Now we have a list that we'll get to in a little bit of all the different wives so that we can see which one and who was what. In January of 1532, Cranmer was appointed the resident ambassador at the court of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. As the emperor traveled throughout his realm, Cranmer had to follow him to his residence in Ratisbon. So the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V uh, travels with Cranmer. He learns a lot of things. He sees a lot of things. And that's when a lot of times he comes into contact with other reformers, Protestants, who are now with English copies of the Bible able to teach people and people are able to learn much more than before when everything was in Latin or original languages. And uh, later on, I believe Henry the Seventh or Eighth, who we got here, Henry, Charles, Edward, I think it was, one of them uh, put a thing out that said anybody under the age of a gentleman, so to say, couldn't read the English Bible. It wasn't allowed. They had to wait till they were older because they were having problems with people that they didn't like reading the Bible and telling the bishops or the popes they were wrong, and they were just saying, well, you're too young. You don't understand. Wait till you're older. We can teach you the right way to read the English Bible. But Protestantism, as it spreads, says no to that regularly. That's why we're always encouraged, you read your Bible. Don't do what we say just because we've said that. But if we preach it, you read it in the Word. And that's what was taking place as they continue to go through. So now he becomes uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. If you don't know what an Archbishop is, there's a bishop that's over uh, the majority, and there's Archbishops over certain areas. So Canterbury is a city, it's a town, that's where he lived, and that's where he became the Archbishop. Uh, the Church of England, under uh, Henry the Seventh and Eighth, uh, began to distance itself from Rome and the Catholic Papal Authority, except that uh, several of the kings would still want uh, Catholicism uh, in some ways, but they would not want the Pope to be the authority. They wanted to be the authority. So we have different groups that are splitting now. So some are saying the Pope is the ultimate religious authority, and the king is saying he is, and the Pope is subservient to him. And King Henry VII, I believe, uh, had Protestants and Catholics at different times uh, persecuted, uh, burned at the stake for uh, not agreeing. So really it was a tough job if you got it. Uh, sometimes you wanted it, but then once you got it, and the king said, no, here's what you're going to say, and you say, but, the, but God had already said, you kind of decide right then, okay, I'll go with you, and we'll see what happens. Uh, when Cranmer's promotion became known in London, it caused great surprise, as Cranmer had previously held only minor positions in the church. Now, it took him eight years to get his undergrad, and when he graduated, he was number 32 in the top 10, right? The top 10 of the best students. He was number 32 out of 42. So this guy isn't the smartest, greatest, most applied to his trade. Uh, people look at it and go, How, why, why would he be chosen to be the archbishop? 
But if you remember, he works with the annulment process uh, for King Henry VIII in one of his marriages. So Henry fi uh, personally financed the papal bulls. Papal bulls are not cattle. They are written decrees from a pope that would say that this person is in charge or that person is uh, discredited or this person, this is a new thing we're going to do. And uh, you can finance those because uh, money pretty much does whatever you need it to. So if you think about it, uh, papal bulls were easily acquired because the papal nuncio was under orders from Rome to please the English in an effort to prevent a final breach. They didn't want any more problems, so they're kind of like, what do they want to do? Who do they want to put in charge? Uh, King Henry VIII says he wants this guy. Okay, let's let him have that. Let's, he's already put him in place, and they're going to send the paperwork later because money. So that's how that goes. So on the 23rd of May, Cranmer pronounced the judgment that Henry's marriage with Catherine of Aragorn uh, was against the law of God. So he was granted his divorce, and it was kind of because he kind of liked somebody else. And that happens five more times. Um, on June 1st, Cramner personally crowned and anointed Anne queen and delivered to her the scepter and rod. He got his position because he was willing to do the divorce. And when they met, that's what everybody's thinking. Like, this is not the guy next in line. He shouldn't have been chosen. Uh, but he was, and because of what happens, uh, January 29th, 1536, when Anne, this is his second wife, miscarried a son, the king began to reflect again on the biblical prohibitions that had haunted him during his marriage with Catherine of Aragon. Shortly after the miscarriage, the king started to take an interest in Jane Seymour, which would be his next wife. So the king, still holding true to the reality that he was higher up, and also um, Cranmer agreeing that the kings were sovereign, uh, not a good thing, but it is what he believed and what he held to for a short time. Because of where he was, because of how he was put in place, uh, he has the opportunity to help establish uh, England's church. What is it going to be like? What's going to function? How is it going to look? And what's going to take place? Okay. So reforming the church, going from the Pope and the Catholicism into a Protestantism with the Bible, you're going to see a huge difference where he begins uh, to put his life into that. With the atmosphere in Cranmer's favor, he pursued quiet efforts to reform the church, particularly the liturgy. On the 27th of May in 1544, the first officially authorized vernacular service was published. The processional service of intercession known as the exhortation and litany. It survives today with minor modifications in the Book of Common Prayer. Liturgies are the functions that what the church does, things the church does. Okay, liturgies in our church would be the Lord's Supper and baptism are two that we would do. Now, as we take communion, which we'll see later is the Eucharist, and we're going to see that his view really begins to split. And that's where he gets into trouble, where he clearly identifies himself as a Protestant. And then when Bloody Mary gets in charge, it doesn't go well. So we're going to see what happens there. Cranmer's Eucharist views, which had already moved away from official Catholic doctrine, received another push from continental reformers. So a lot of these different reformers are all their writings and different things. He's beginning to understand it. So here's what happens uh, with the Eucharist. Okay, The Eucharist is like the Lord's table. It's taking communion, the bread or the cracker and the, the wine, Okay, the juice. Okay, I still got it up there. Okay. And what Catholics believe, now when I say Catholics believe, there are some that do to this day, called transubstantiation. Transubstantiation is, is when you watch, kids, when you guys watch us take communion, we're saying symbolically the bread represents the body of Jesus. And we're saying the juice, which some might use wine, but we use juice, would say this represents his blood that was spilled to pay for our sins. We take that as a symbol and we remember what he had done to hopefully remind us that the next time with Christ, okay? So in the Catholic view, most but not all. So you have a Catholic friend. Do you believe in transubstantiation? They may not know what you're talking about and say no. No, we don't believe that. So some don't, but some do. That when you take the bread, it actually becomes the body. When you take the wine or the juice, it becomes the blood. It physically becomes something that you take on physically interacting with the body of Christ. But it's not. 
And he came out with this view in the Eucharist view to say, no, it's just a spiritual representation, not a physical one. And uh, heads clashed over that one, except for the Protestant reformers. They're going like, yeah, that's not how it works. That's not what it is. So Catholic, yes, they say it is. And Protestants, obviously, we practicing today don't say that. You're not actually taking, it doesn't change, okay? Um, and that's the, the view that some hold, but it's not really a popular view. Just like in churches where we have some Baptist churches that would say the King James Version of the Bible was inspired by God. Not just the original writings, but the King James. Some do believe that. Most don't. So obviously you tell someone you're a Baptist or you're a Christian, oh, you're, you're a Protestant, oh, so you, you, know, you believe this, this, and this, right? So when you talk in conversations with people, you can look back through history and start to understand that as these Protestant reformers were coming through, they were saying, no, the Bible says... And we're having to distinguish between what did the king want, what did the king say, and what did the pope say got added to it. So we see the Catholic Church as a whole, with authority on its shoulders, be able to do what it wants to do to force people into that. And we're going to see that as several reformers don't make it very well. So the Book of Common Prayer is what Cranmer wrote. The original book was published in 1549. The reign of Edward VI was a product of the English Reformation following the break with Rome. Prayer books, unlike books of prayers, contain the words of structured or liturgical, liturgical yeah, that's right, services of worship. Now, liturgy, like I said, is a form or a formulary according to which public religious worship, especially Christian worship, is conducted. You know Sundays when you come in, you get a bulletin? We're trying to call it sometimes a worship guide. Kind of walks you through. We're going to sing. We're going to take an offering. Okay? So if you go further back, and some churches still do this today, they would call it a, a hymn, a call to worship. Certain songs will be sung for that. Then it's a call to adoration in certain songs. A call to thanksgiving. Oh, get this. This Sunday, during our time of prayer, that's what we're going to do. And you're going to be handed what you could say is a liturgy. Here, Prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of adoration. We're going to do that because it just gives us a guide to worship from. From some of those liturgies, you've got ashes, Ash Wednesday. You've got a lot of other things, Palm Sunday, and became ritualistic. They didn't just mean something, they became something. They became a whole lot more. So when you talk with Catholic friends around Easter and different holidays, they got a lot more stuff going on. And when you go into a service, a lot more happens. When you go to a funeral at a Catholic church, there's a lot of things that happen because there are liturgies for funerals, just like we would have an order of a service for a funeral. But it wouldn't matter either way. If we all just walked over to them and was like, okay, they're gone, and then we left, that wouldn't change anything. But in the Catholic Church, based on liturgies, you don't do it right. There's all kinds of problems with where they end up and how long they end up there. Uh, Protestant conceptions of the Eucharist differ in one very important way from the Catholic conception of the sacrament. Catholics believe that though the words and actions of the priest transubstantiation occurs and that the bread and wine that the priest hold become in reality the body and blood of Christ. Now, Edward VI, Edward VI, the son of Henry VIII and Jane Seymour. Edward was sickly. It is thought he suffered from tuberculosis. Edward succeeded his father at the age of nine. Lincoln is nine. If I was the king and I died, Lincoln would become the king. Trampolines for everybody, right? <laughs> What would a nine-year-old know to do? Okay, so the government was carried on by a council of regency with his uncle, Duke of Somerset. Uh, even though this reign was short, many men made their mark. Cranmer wrote the Book of Common Prayer, and the uniformity of worship helped turn England into a Protestant state. After Edward's death, there was a dispute over the succession, as Mary was Catholic, and Lady Jane Grey was named as the next in line to the throne. She was proclaimed queen, but Mary entered London with her supporters, and Jane was taken to the tower. Okay, the tower is where a lot of Protestants end up. That's prison right before you get burned. Uh, she reigned for only nine days, and then she was executed in 1554 at the age of 17. So the daughter of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragorn, a devout Catholic, she married Philip of Spain. Mary attempted to enforce the wholesale conversion of England to Catholicism. She carried this out with the utmost severity. The Protestant bishops, Latimer, Ridley, and Archbishop Cranmer were among those burnt at the stake. 
The place in Broad Street, Oxford, is marked by a bronze cross. The country was plunged into a bitter bloodbath, which is why she is remembered as Bloody Mary. She died in 1558. She came to the point, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to the Book of Common Prayer. As the use of English in worship services spread, the need for a complete uniform liturgy for the church became evident. Initial meetings to start what would eventually become the Book of Common Prayer were held in the former Abbey of Chertsey and in Windsor Castle in September of 1548. A few years later, he gets in an argument with John Knox and a couple of other reformers about whether they should sit down or kneel when they take um, uh, communion or the Eucharist as they participated. And they argued about what happened at the Lord's Supper, whether they were sitting down or if they should have knelt. So if you watch Catholic services, sometimes the priest would stand in the front. Sometimes they come and they kneel and they take the stuff or not. Sometimes they stand. Uh, some, we, we, what do we do? We sit. Or we stand. I don't know that I've been at a church where you stand and take communion, but you could, and it wouldn't matter either way because were the disciples standing up or sitting down? That's not the point. Uh, so they argued back and forth. Jamie Lackey sent me. He was reading a different book on some other stuff, and, of course, my character showed up in some of the, his characters. And we're going to see that. We're going to go back and forth. So, um, But that's kind of what took place. But, but the need for the, for the Protestant church to be unified, uh, and that's why one of the kings, it was Edward VI, I think, came out and said, like, hey, if you're not old enough, you don't read it. It's not allowed. Uh, but he also put English Bibles in all the churches so that people could have it, they could read it. So here comes the end, Cranmer's martyrdom. In his first four recantations, produced between the end of January and mid-February, Cranmer submitted himself to the authority of the king and queen and recognized the pope as the head of the church. This is right after uh, Queen Mary is in charge. He has been put in prison, and then he was taken away as a guest somewhere in Spain, and now he's being brought back. He's been told to recant, and he's been doing it. He's been writing these recantations of Protestantism, the Bible, and the way in which he had been. He's writing that he didn't believe that, and it's wrong. So he, he does that several times. Cranmer was told that he will be able to make a final recantation, but this time in public during a service at the university church. At this point, he's now seeing uh, that Ridley and some of these other men have been burned at the stake. They wouldn't recant, they wouldn't change, and then they were just burned at the stake. He's kind of recanting. He's kind of saying, no, 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 okay, 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 the Pope is true, right? So he's thinking he's going to live. Except Bloody Mary, as we know her, says, no, I'm going to make an example March 7th, I believe, if I got my dates right, which will come up in just a second, she says that's when he's going to die. So now he's sitting there thinking, oh, they're going to kill me anyway. You ever been in that situation, even in a small way, where you think you're going to lose something, whether it's saving face or staying popular or staying at peace, and you didn't share the gospel, and you were quiet? Do you imagine how you feel afterwards? Like, I didn't do it. Now is his chance, a public recantation, which he had to submit a speech. They approved it. He started to read through it. Uh, after Edward VI's death, Cranmer supported by Lady Jane, uh, sorry, after Edward VI's death, Cranmer supported Lady Jane Grey as successor. Her nine-day reign was followed by the Roman Catholic Mary I, who tried him for treason. After a long trial and imprisonment, he was forced to proclaim to the public his error in the support of Protestant Protestantism, an act designed to discourage followers of the religion. Uh, he was sentenced uh, to death March 21st, okay? So he renounced the recantation that he had written or signed with his own hand since his degradation, and as such, he stated his hand would be punished by being burnt first. So publicly, he got up and did part of the speech, and then he stopped, and then he said... Uh, and as for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy uh, and Antichrist with all his false doctrine. He was taken out of the pulpit and drug away, and then things were going to continue as they were. As the flames drew around him, they gather him together, they put him on a wood pile, they start the fire. As the flames drew around him, he fulfilled his promise by placing his right hand into the heart of the fire while saying, that unworthy hand the hand he had wrote those recantations of his Protestantism and his beliefs. Um, and his dying words were, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I see the heavens open and Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. So we come to the end of his life and he realizes the mistakes that he had made. And then as he dies, that's where the quote came from, that unworthy hand. The hand he wrote those with, he burned first and he died 
because he was being made an example. Persecution and authority of the Catholic Church. It was England becoming Protestant and then Queen Mary saying, I'll have none of that. We're going to be Catholic, and if you're not, you'll die. Um, and then it went downhill from there. Didn't go well for him. I mean, it really didn't. For his whole life, he got into position because, well, he got into position. And then what he did with it was good, but then he was taught through a lot of different reformers and different things happened to him. And in the end, he tried to deny it and thinking he would live, but he didn't. So then he recanted of his recantations again. Right. And, and really, he was becoming the example of, we're going to make you do it, and we're going to prove to everybody that everything you said was wrong. Because the Book of Common Prayer was very popular, and people understood it. And it allowed them to worship without the state, without the pope, without anybody else controlling them. They could worship as we do now. We don't need the government to say, okay, yes, you can or no, you can't. We do it on our own because we have the Word of God, and that's what was happening. We see the early 13, 14, and 1500s, it explodes that way, but then the persecution hits it just the same, where it's like, wow. Uh, and uh, a lot of times, um, I think me and Pastor Brian talked about this a long time ago. You look at different ISIS people, and they capture people, um, and they won't let them be martyrs. They won't let them shout out in Jesus' name or anything. They just show them kindness repeatedly. I think one of the guys over and over and over again was just shown uh, like they're going to practice run, kill him, and so that he wouldn't panic at all. And then they just one day did it. Uh, and then there was no standing, no being bold, no nothing. It was they're in charge. And that's what people are somewhat learning. You don't make martyrs. You don't let people uh, make a statement and take a stand. You humble them, and then it's just over uh, because... You look at what martyrs have done throughout history. Uh, we know more because of his martyrdom. And with a lot of the guys that we're going to see, the first few guys that get the Bible, uh, they die because you're not supposed to do that. You're not allowed to do that, so to say.